Welcome to the Dynamic Duel Podcast, a weekly show where we review superhero films and debate the superiority between Marvel and DC by comparing their characters in stat-based battle simulations. I'm Johnny DC. And I'm his twin brother, Marvelous Joe. And in this episode, we are doing a duel between the Justice League android hero, Red Tornado, and the Spider-Man villain, Sandman. Both of these characters have elemental powers. Red Tornado controls air, and Sandman controls sand... (laughs) So we figured that it might be a good matchup considering, you know, we've done a few fire and ice battles in the past, like Human Torch versus Killer Frost. So we figured, you know, why not wind and earth? Yeah, yeah, I think the general public is pretty familiar with Sandman, given that he was in both the Spider-Man 3 movie and the recent Spider-Man No Way Home. Red Tornado has yet to make a movie appearance, but he's a pretty cool character. He did a live action appearance in the Supergirl television series. Oh, he did? Yeah. I did not know that. He looked horrible. (laughs) <laughs> at least, really? at least uh, in photos but in the show actually i think they did a pretty good job with the character interesting well we're gonna find out who's gonna win between the two later on in this episode before that we're gonna break down the comic book movie news that came out in the past week including the news that dakota johnson is going to star in a madam webb film and brother blood and jinx have been cast as villains in titan season four as always we list our segment times in our episode description so feel free to check out the show notes if you want to skip ahead to a particular topic And as we mentioned in our last episode, guys, Jonathan and I have decided to take down the paywall. So the show is no longer subscription based. All the episodes are available to the listening public. But if you want access to bonus content, including bonus episodes, blooper reels and more, be sure to sign up to our Patreon, which is linked in the show notes. Yeah, And if you're listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podchaser or any platform that allows it, please leave us a rating or review. You can also visit our website, dynamicduel.com, and leave a review there in our reviews section. And with that out of the way, quick to the no prize. A no prize is an award Marvel used to give out up until the 90s to fans. Our version, the Dynamic Duel No Prize, is a digital award we post on social media that Jonathan personally draws for those who we feel gave the best answer to our question of the week. And he's been slacking on those drawings recently. Dude, I am caught up. Whatever. <laughs> if you ever want to see a time lapse of my illustrations, actually check out our Instagram account. I have all of them there. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool to see the process. But last week's question was, what's been your favorite episode so far of the podcast and why? And of course, we asked that because there was no comic book movie news to have come out two weeks ago. We got a lot of great answers, though. Really enjoyed all of your picks. It was nearly impossible to choose a winner and honorable mentions. We did our best. Let's go ahead and run down them. Our first honorable mention goes to Richard McGrew, who said, Hey, Rick from the Retro Nama Pod. Best episode that I can recall that comes to mind would be the Poison Ivy versus White Queen. Just your guys' quips during that and the scenario that you put forth for it was amazing. At one point, we're like, where she cracked? Her ass. Terrific. Yeah, that episode was a whole lot of fun to do. If you guys remember, during the actual battle scenario, we had Poison Ivy wrap her vines, I believe, around Emma Frost and then crack her diamond form. And I asked Jonathan, where is she cracked? And you were like, her ass. (laughs) <laughs> it was pretty good that was probably one of the better jokes i think that you've ever done for sure thanks thanks our next honorable mention goes to benjamin alvis who said my personal favorite out of all your episodes is probably x-men origins wolverine because i love hearing you guys you with other people and like roasting the hell out of bad movies like you uh, you guys and adam Adam and John Spees from Blast From Our Past are awesome at doing that. And I'll give a second place to Batman the movie because that was also hilarious. It has been too long since we've had John and Adam on this show. That episode, the X-Men Origins episode, was a ton of fun. Just talking shit about the movie. It was just a blast. Yeah, the Batman the movie episode was a lot of fun to do with them too. That was actually over a year ago since we've had them on the show. we got to get them back maybe sometime within the next few months. We'll have to reach out to them. Yeah, we need to find a really shitty movie to review with them, too. <laughs> I feel bad because we always bring them on for the really shitty movie episodes. But like Benjamin said, you know, they're really good at roasting films. So it's a lot of fun. Our final honorable mention goes to Miggy Mathangian, who said, Hey, what's up, guys? It's Miggy. And my favorite episode has been the Titans versus X-Men duel. 
Uh, the Titans have always been one of my favorite teams, so it's nice having an episode featuring them. And the duel was just the best team duel. It was a lot of fun. You guys sounded like you had a lot of fun doing it, and it was just a great time. Yeah, the team duels are always a lot of fun. We always look forward to doing them. They're like one of the highlights of our year and one of the things we really look forward to as we continue to do these dual episodes. There were a couple people that called in, including Tyson Lee and Jesse Roberts, who both preferred our Justice Society versus Fantastic Four episode, though. Yeah, I think that was my favorite. There was just something about like the Dr. Hawk fate that I just <laughs> loved and would love to see done in the comics. But we want to give a special thanks to Grace, Jonathan's daughter, Jacob Bell, Matt Lamb, Tyson Lee, and Jesse Roberts for calling in and leaving us their answers. We really appreciate it, guys. Especially Grace, because she's done this a few times. And she always looks so heartbroken when we don't choose her as an <laughs> honorable mention. I love you. I'm a horrible father. <laughs> How is she listening to this podcast when you cuss up a storm in it? Well, I, I just tried to turn down like the volume knob down right away. <laughs> She knows those are words for adults. But the winner of this week's No Prize goes to John Storowski, who said... Hey guys, John Storowski. My favorite episode, and it's going to sound crazy, is Secret Origins of Johnny DC and Marvelous Joe. Knowing where you guys came from, what inspired you, and what made you want to do this podcast has been an enlightening and inspiring experience for me. It's actually made me want to start my own podcast, and... You guys make it seem like it's possible. So that's my answer. Take care. That's right. If we could do it, anybody could do it. I'm not sure how many people have actually gone back and listened to the very first episode of this podcast. It was actually a re-recording of our very first episode because the very first recording we ever did back in January 2016 was just a shit show. It was so bad. Yeah. Um, we decided to re-record it so that people who decided to start at the beginning wouldn't be turned off by how much we sucked. <laughs> But it's a quick listen. It's only about 18 minutes long, I think. And it basically just details what the podcast is going to be about and goes into my and Jonathan's backstories as fans of DC and Marvel. It's not particularly exciting, I think, but I guess it's informative for people who want to learn more about us. Well, yeah, it's a good introduction, which, you know, we designed it to be that. So, yeah, hopefully you do listen to it. Hopefully you have listened to it if you've been a longtime listener and if you haven't, check it out. Yeah, and John Starosky is one of the executive producers of this show. He and one of our other executive producers, Zachary Hepburn, are in the process of making their own movie-based podcast. Yeah, we'll make sure to give you guys all of the details once we get them, so look forward to that. But on the topic of this question of the week, what would you say, Jonathan, is your favorite episode that we've done? Oh, man. As much as I like the dual episodes, I think we get most insightful during our reviews, and I think that's what I like the most. For some reason, I've listened to our Superman Red Sun episode a number of times. Uh, but actually, our number one listened to episode of all time is the Joker review. So that's one of my favorite episodes, along with our Dark Knight review that we did with Craig. Yeah, I think my all time favorite episode is the Punisher review that we did with Ken Johnson. Yeah, that was a cool one. Yeah, that's my favorite review. As far as duels go, I've always been a big fan of our Justice League versus Avengers episode, just because that was our 100th episode. It was our first team duel, and I felt like that was when we really hit our stride. 100 episodes in. <laughs> but congrats again to John Starosky for winning this week's No Prize. If you, the listener, want a shot at winning your own No Prize, stay tuned to later on this episode when we'll be asking another question of the week. And now that that's done, on to the news. <laughs> All right, this past week, out of fucking nowhere, we learned that not only is there going to be a Madam Web film, but it already has its star and director in Dakota Johnson and S.J. Clarkson, respectively. Now, Dakota Johnson is an up-and-coming actress ever since she's been in the Fifty Shades of Grey series, which I never saw. But it seems like she's been primed to take over a superhero movie role at some point, because she has the look. What is surprising, though, is that she's playing Madam Webb, who's traditionally known in the comics as being, you know, this geriatric paraplegic uh, with a blindfold over her face. You know, she has clairvoyant powers and she monitors the web of life and destiny, which holds everybody's fates and, you know, is tied to the multiverse. But it doesn't seem like the type of character that a young actress like Dakota Johnson would actually play. Yeah. So what do you think they're going to like de-age the character for Dakota Johnson? 
No, I think what's going to happen is that in the comics, the original Madam Web died and passed her mantle on to the second version of Spider-Woman, Julia Carpenter. I have never heard of her. Julia Carpenter's the redheaded Spider-Woman, and she shoots out like the Psy Webs. She was in the first Secret Wars crossover. Okay. Wait, she shoots psychic webs? Yes. Well, that's kind of cool. Yeah, so she was a good fit to replace Madam Web, who yeah. was also psychic. That is cool. That being said, you know, the second iteration of Madam Web is fairly new, and I feel like doesn't have a substantial enough storyline to warrant an entire film. Unless they're going down the route of the Spider-Verse or something. And this might be Sony's way of consolidating their Spider-Universe, as it were. You know, bringing Venom together in the same universe as Morbius, as the Vulture, as Spider-Man, all that stuff. Well, that would be cool. It just seems like this is a really roundabout way of doing it. I would rather just see a Spider-Verse live action movie than to create this film based on a character that hardly anybody knows and do it that way. I've seen a lot of flack online about how little people know about Madam Web, but I'm like, how many people knew about Guardians of the Galaxy? Just because they're unknown doesn't mean it's not going to be good. I mean, that's valid, but on one hand, you have Marvel, who had a proven track record when they were producing Guardians of the Galaxy, and then you have Sony, who is sometimes hit or miss, but mostly miss. That's fair. That's fair. We'll see how Morbius is. Yeah, if Morbius bombs, because there's not a whole lot of demand for that movie, there's like way less for a Madam Web movie, so I assume that this project might even get scrapped. Really? But if Morbius succeeds then this movie might be fast-tracked considering that it has the same writers as Morbius. Oh, interesting. Okay. It definitely seems like Sony's really scraping the bottom of the barrel for that, you know, Spider-Man IP. Yeah, I mean, I, I would have rather have seen a Spider-Woman movie over a Madam Web movie. I mean, we know that Olivia Wilde is currently working on a Spider-Woman movie, supposedly Jessica Drew, and it seems like that project's been in the works for over a year now. I don't know what's happening with that. This Madam Web movie seems much further along considering it has a star. Well, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if No Way Home like drastically changed Sony's plans for their Spider-Man universe. And since Madam Web sort of has ties to the multiverse, it wouldn't surprise me if her movie took precedence over everything else. Oh, yeah, we'll see how this project develops for sure. But speaking of female-led Spider-Man related characters, that brings us to our question of the week. Which female Spider-Man related character would you be most interested in seeing in a live action film? Yeah, it could be this Madam Web story. It could be, you know, a Jessica Drew story, a Gwen Stacy, Spider-Gwen story, Silk. There are so many different female characters related to the Spider-Man universe that you, that you could pick from. Which one do you think is the most viable option for a full length live action film? Record your answer at dynamicduel.com by clicking on the red microphone button in the bottom right-hand corner, which will prompt you to leave us a voicemail. Your message can be up to 30 seconds long, and don't forget to leave your name in case we include you on the podcast. We'll pick our favorite answer and draw that person a Dynamic Duel no prize that we'll post to social media. Be sure to answer before February 12th. So in DC news, Titan Season 4 apparently has cast its villains in Brother Blood and Jinx. Now, Brother Blood is going to be, I guess, the main bad guy, and Jinx is just going to be a recurring character. But for fans of the comics and maybe the cartoons, this is exciting news. Brother Blood, of course, is the head of the Church of Blood, which is a cult in the comics dedicated to Trigon. But he's a pretty cool character. He's, he's almost like a vampire, but not quite. He drinks blood, and when he does, he gets your powers. It looks like the character will be played by Joseph Morgan, who I have no idea who that is, but he has a pretty cool look. Now, I've only seen Titans Season 3. I never saw Season 1. I thought Brother Blood and the Church of Blood were the main antagonists of Season 1. No, no, Trigon was the main antagonist of Season 1, but they also oh, have okay. the nuclear family in that show. Maybe you thought that was the Church of Blood, but no, it's not. It does make me wonder if Trigon is coming back as a villain for this new season, which would be awesome because he's sort of like, I think, their ultimate bad guy and uh, would definitely make the character of Raven more relevant to the series because she was largely absent in season three. Now, who's Jinx? What does Jinx do? Jinx has like elemental powers, but she also has bad luck powers. Uh, she was made pretty popular in the Teen Titans cartoon. They like redesigned her for that show. And uh, she's also pretty popular in Teen Titans Go as well. But she's also a member of the Fearsome Five. So this makes me wonder if we'll see more of those characters in the show. They're kind of like the rival villain team for the Titans. Jinx apparently is going to be played by Lisa Abelevenar. 
Again, no idea who that is, but still excited that the character is on the show. Yeah, we may have to squeeze in some duels with those characters around the time of that season's release. I think Baron Blood on Marvel might be a good matchup to go against Brother Blood. Oh, that's interesting. I I actually don't know who Baron Blood is. He's a vampire on Marvel. Yeah, that could totally work. Do you know when season four is supposed to come out? Uh, no, we don't have a premiere date for that yet. I'd be surprised if it came out this year. I don't think it'll probably hit until early next year. Season three had some really cool moments, and I'll be interested in seeing what they do for season four. Sounds cool. Well, I think that does it for all the news for this episode. So let's go ahead and find out who would win in a fight between DC's Air Elemental Red Tornado and Marvel's Earth-based Spider-Man villain Sandman. Okay, Red Tornado versus Sandman. Of course, this is a tie-in to our last episode, which was a review of Spider-Man 3, where Sandman was one of the main villains. But as we mentioned earlier in this episode also, he recently appeared in Spider-Man No Way Home, which is now like one of the highest grossing films of all time. It's ridiculous. We figured now was as good a time as any to do a duel with Sandman, the character. Yeah, Sandman is the last of the villain group that we have to do a duel with and lead up to our next team duel, which will be in a couple of months where we pit Arkham Asylum characters against the Sinister Six. Cannot wait for that one. That one's going to be epic. Yeah, it is. You're going to get the shit kicked out of you. Whatever, dude. You're about to get the shit kicked out of you right now. (laughs) But no, I think this Sandman versus Red Tornado fight is going to be a lot of fun. They're both pretty dang powerful and can use their elemental abilities for a variety of cool effects. Yeah, there were a few people who wanted us to pit uh, Sandman against Clayface, but of course we've already done a duel between Clayface and Venom. And then another option that we had to pit against Sandman was actually DC Sandman, not the Morpheus one, but the one in the JSA, specifically Sanderson Hawkins, which wouldn't have been a bad match. I think it would have been... Pretty close to 50-50, though, considering that they have really, really similar power sets. This match, though, I have no idea who's going to win. I think that's what gets me really excited for it. Well, we definitely should get a matchup with DC Sandman on the books sometime in the near future. Yeah, that'd be cool. I love the character. Now, if you've never listened to one of our Duel episodes before, the way we determine a winner between these two characters is by running 1,000 Monte Carlo simulations using their statistics. Now, a Monte Carlo simulation is a probabilistic model used to determine outcomes through random sampling. In our case, it randomizes statistics along a normal distribution, which is a bell curve, as a way to simulate the many variables that can occur during battle. The stat parameters we use are based on the official Marvel power grid, and we use that criteria to extrapolate the DC character stats. We've included some additional stat categories of our own, such as range, damage, potential, versatility, and perception, in order to create a more complete and robust simulation. Running these 1000 simulations gives us a percentage of wins for each character, and we declare the one with the higher percentage to be the ultimate victor, considering that they're more likely to win any given battle. No character ever wins 100% of the time. Comics have shown that there's always a way for Batman to defeat Superman, and we feel our method falls in line with the precedents that have been established in the comic book stories. And we use this method because it was the least subjective, most unbiased way to determine who would win. Of course, Joseph and I are both heavily biased toward our respective allegiances, and instead of debating these matches forever, we just let the math decide for us. So there's no fan votes here, and no relying on just feats. Before we run the simulations, though, we like to break down each character's histories and abilities, before improvising a scenario on how we imagine one of the 1,000 simulations we run would play out beat for beat. And I think it's my turn to go first with a Marvel character, so let me go ahead and tell you all about Sandman. Now, William Baker was born in Queens, New York, to Floyd Baker and an unnamed mother. When William was just three years old, his father abandoned his family, and he was raised by his mom, who had become an alcoholic. His happiest moments from his childhood were during visits to the beach at Coney Island, where he loved playing in the sand and building intricate sand castles, though their temporary nature saddened him as they would always wash away. William and his mom were impoverished, and he was forced to learn how to steal to take care of them. In school, he was harassed by bullies for being poor until one day when he fought back, becoming friends with his tormentors and a bully himself. 
William and his new pals formed a gang, and he started going by the name Flint Marco to sound tougher and prevent his mom from learning about his unruly activities. He was expelled from school after getting caught throwing a football game for money and beating up his football coach when he was caught. Flint turned to robbery and became quite successful in New York's criminal underworld. Eventually, he was arrested and landed in Rikers Island Prison. There, Flint met his father Floyd for the first time as an adult and spent time with him until his father's release from prison, at which point Flint decided he was going to break out. He crawled out of Rikers through an unguarded drainage pipe and washed up on an island that served as an atomic testing site. As Flint lay on the sandy beach, an experimental reactor exploded, irradiating his body's molecules and bonding them to the sand around him. Impressed with his new ability to turn himself into sand and reshape his form, he called himself Sandman and made his way back to New York City. After going on a crime spree, Flint ran into Spider-Man while hiding out in his high school. Though the hero struggled against Flint's indestructible sand form, he managed to defeat him by sucking him up in a vacuum and handing it over to authorities. Oh shit! Flint found his father had also landed back in prison, and he used his new powers to break himself and Floyd out. He took his father to Coney Island, where Spider-Man spotted them. Enraged, Flint drew on the surrounding beach sand to increase his size to a giant form, and attacked Spider-Man with the Coney Island Ferris wheel. However, a heavy rainstorm made Flint struggle to keep his form, and a bolt of lightning fused him into glass and shattered him to pieces. Flint eventually reconstituted and later joined forces with other Spider-Man villains to form the Sinister Six, which included himself, Dr. Octopus, Kraven the Hunter, Electro, Vulture, and Mysterio, each of whom you can learn more about in their respective duel episodes against Mr. Freeze, Vixen, The Flash, Firefly, and Scarecrow respectively. The villains attacked Spider-Man one at a time in a grueling gauntlet. Sandman's attack involved sealing Spider-Man in an airtight steel box where the hero was powerless to fend off Flint's sand attacks. However, the box soon ran out of air and Flint collapsed due to lack of oxygen and Spider-Man escaped having stronger lungs. You can learn more about Spider-Man in our dual episode where we pit him against Blue Beetle. After losing repeatedly to the wall crawler, Flint began fighting other heroes such as the Hulk and the Fantastic Four. He helped form another villain team called the Frightful Four alongside the Wizard, Medusa, and the Trapster, and they attacked Mr. Fantastic and Invisible Woman's engagement party, though they were defeated. Flint later met and became attracted to a woman he met at a bar, though the fellow Spider-Man villain Hydro-Man was a rival for her affections. The two fought each other throughout the city, with the battle culminating in the Hudson River, where the polluted water merged Flint and Hydro-Man, sand and water, forming both into a single mindless creature called Mud Thing. <laughs> Though scientists studied the creature and tried all manner of chemical and radiation-based treatments to separate Flint and Hydro-Man, they gave up and dumped Mud Thing into a landfill. The treatments did work over time, however, and in a delayed effect, Flint and Hydro-Man managed to separate into their own forms. Flint's time spent as a mindless being traumatized him and caused him to rethink his life's choices. Convinced by the Thing to use his powers as a force for good, Flint began helping his old foe Spider-Man out against villains such as the Enforcers and the Sinister Syndicate. Spider-Man's ally Silver Sable was impressed with Flint's capabilities and reform status and invited him to join her team of heroic mercenaries called the Wild Pack. Though the group was primarily composed of soldiers, Silver Sable included Sandman in an elite superhuman unit within the Wild Pack known as the Outlaws which included other reformed Spider-Man villains such as Prowler, Rocket Racer, the Puma, and Will-O-The-Wisp, who would all help out Spider-Man on occasion. Due to Flint's efforts in combating terrorism and supervillains with the Outlaws, Flint received a presidential pardon for his past crimes. And after the team fought alongside the Avengers and Spider-Man, Flint was made a probationary reserve member of the Avengers. Oh, wow. He helped the team fight against large threats such as Doctor Doom, the Deviants, and the sorceress Morgan Le Fay. His former villainous allies weren't happy with his new status as a hero, however, with both Doctor Octopus and the Wizard each trying to recruit Flint back into the Sinister Six and the Frightful Four, respectively. Doctor Octopus went so far as to turn Flint into glass and shattered him, though Flint was able to reform as Broken Glass Man and nearly killed Octavius before Spider-Man reminded him of his reformed ways. The Wizard, however, developed a machine that enhanced a person's dark side and used it on Flint to turn him back into a villain. 
Flint reformed the Sinister Six team, but during a battle he was washed down a sewer and spread along Jones Beach. This broad separation of himself across the sands caused his mind to be split, and when he reformed, he now had the ability to duplicate himself. After one of his former romantic flings was murdered, he took her daughter, named Camilla, into his care. He rejoined the Sinister Six to earn money to gain custody of her, and was ordered to guard a base in the Sahara Desert. Spider-Man managed to locate and isolate the one grain of sand in the desert that housed Flint's mind, and Black Widow interrogated him to learn the Sinister Six's secret plan. Flint later temporarily lost his ability to retain his human form, and seemingly crumbled and died at the beach of his childhood, but discovered that not only was he still alive, but was effectively immortal. Flint recently rejoined the Sinister Six with Dr. Octopus, who promised to put his scientific genius to work in returning Flint's mortality. Wait, he didn't want to be immortal? No, he didn't want to live forever. Powers-wise, Sandman's original ability was to convert his silicon-based body into sand. Over the years, however, his state progressed so that he is now simply composed of animated sand that he can reshape into a humanoid form, and he no longer ages, eats, sleeps, or breathes. He has subliminal awareness and telekinetic control of all the grains and particles in his body, granting him density control that in turn can make him intangible or super dense and strong enough to lift up to 85 tons. Sandman can stretch and shapeshift his entire body into any form, such as flattening himself or shaping his limbs into weapons like hammers, maces, or blades. He can also blast his sand particles forward as a smaller projectile like a shotgun shot or a larger projectile like a hurling boulder. He can control surrounding sand and use it offensively, incorporate it into himself to increase his size, or use it to create sand duplicates of himself. He can effectively fly by turning into a stream of sand that he can control through the air. Lastly, Sandman has a weakness to water, which softens and weakens his cohesion, and extreme heat, which hardens him into glass. And that's Sandman. There aren't two weaknesses that Red Tornado cannot exploit. No, definitely not. And I should say that it was kind of retconned when Spider-Man beat him using a vacuum. He basically stated that he wanted to get caught at the time to go back to prison to see his father. Okay. okay. And he's like, I could have exploded out of that vacuum at any time. And other people have tried to use like wind against him. And sometimes they've been successful, but not if he hardens his form. So well, good luck with that. We'll see if that yeah. works. Because honestly, like what can wind do to a rock? Nothing. Have you ever heard of erosion? Yeah, I've heard that it takes like thousands of years. Not this time. Not this time. Let me get into Red Tornado's backstory. So the original Red Tornado was a burly grocer and mother named Abigail Hunkel, who wore a stove pot for a helmet as part of her superhero outfit to disguise her identity when protecting her children and their friends from local mobsters back in DC's Golden Age. Abigail, often referred to as Ma Hunkel, was present during the initial formation of the JSA, though she left immediately after accidentally ripping her pants. Like everyone, <laughs> the JSA believed the Red Tornado was a man, though they eventually learned her true identity and she became an honorary, if not active, member of the team. If you remember from our JSA vs. Fantastic Four duel episode, you'll remember that the JSA was the premier super team on Earth 2 of DC's Infinite Multiverse. And if you've listened to our Swamp Thing vs. Man Thing or Firestorm vs. Cersei duel episodes, you'll be familiar with DC's concepts of elemental beings. Swamp Thing was the Earth Elemental, and Firestorm became the Fire Elemental. Well, Earth 1's Air Elemental originated in the Alpha Centauri solar system on the planet Ran, as a being known as Ulthun, a giant and destructive sentient tornado. Once Ran gained a protector in the Earthman Adam Strange, who you can learn more about in our Adam Strange vs. Star Lord duel episode, Ulthun was prevented from destroying a Ranian city by the planet's new hero. Enraged, Ulthun later retaliated forcing Strange to summon help from the Justice League of America to defeat Ulthun once again. Defeated twice, Ulthun contemplated his losses and the nature of good and evil. Recognizing that the Justice League was good, and deciding good was superior to evil, Ulthun's being was split in two, as his destructive personality rejected this conclusion. The destructive force of nature became known as the Tornado Tyrant, while the force for good became the Tornado Champion. The two aspects fought, with the champion recreating the Justice League to take on the Tyrant. 
The tyrant proved victorious, however, and the champion was forced to flee across space to Earth, luring the tyrant to the real Justice League, who managed to defeat him. Discouraged by his ability to do good, the Tornado Champion left Earth-1 to get a fresh start in the Earth-2 dimension, where he was captured by the JSA villain T.O. Morrow to power an android shell. T.O. Morrow is a scientific genius and inventor. The Tornado Champion's memory was lost in the process, and he succumbed to the android's programming, designed by Morrow to infiltrate the JSA as its long-lost founding member, the Red Tornado. Morrow thought the Red Tornado was a man, but the JSA knew better, and reluctantly allowed him to join them, as the Red Tornado was clearly confused and distraught over who and what he was. Intending to prove himself as a force for good, Red Tornado tried to help prevent a burglary at a nearby museum. Though due to his programming, through a series of mishaps, he accidentally defeated the JSA. When Red Tornado discovered what happened and tracked down Morrow, the evil scientist fled to Earth-1, where Red Tornado followed him and with the help of the Justice League was able to defeat Morrow and revive the JSA back on Earth-2. The Red Tornado became a secondary member of both the Justice League and JSA on both Earths. Due to the nature of his android body, he often sacrificed himself on missions, only to be rebuilt and revived in the other dimension. Over time, Red Tornado, desiring consistency and a human identity, was rebuilt with an android body capable of transforming into a human-looking shell, and Red Tornado took on the alter ego named John Smith. He met and developed a romantic relationship with a woman named Kathy Sutton, and he adopted a daughter named Treya. Red Tornado eventually acquired an arch nemesis known as Construct, a sentient being composed of radio and electromagnetic waves, who took over Red Tornado's body for a time and attacked the Justice League. Though Red Tornado was saved from the Construct, the League was later attacked by more Red Tornadoes after T.O. Morrow created android duplicates of the hero and successfully kidnapped the true Red Tornado to find out how he overcame his programming. After Morrow accidentally unleashed the Tornado Champion and Tornado Tyrant, who was discovered to be bound to the Champion after all these years, the Tyrant defeated the League, save for Firestorm, who helped infuse the Tyrant and the Champion back into the Red Tornado shell though his memory had been wiped. During the Crisis on Infinite Earths, the Anti-Monitor destroyed Red Tornado's body, and following the event, the Tornado Champion operated without a body as the Air Elemental. Air pollution drove him mad, however, so a new synthetic body was created for him by Firestorm. Over time, Red Tornado's past personality and memories returned, and he was reunited with his family, during which time he also became a mentor to the young superhero team, Young Justice. During the Infinite Crisis storyline, Red Tornado's body was destroyed by a Zeta Beam. Green Lantern was able to collect all of his body pieces, and he was rebuilt by Will Magnus, a brilliant scientist that you can learn more about in our Metal Men vs. Colossus episode. Red Tornado's soul, however, was tricked into inhabiting a recently deceased clone of the villain Multiplex. Possessing a human body for the first time, Red Tornado as John Smith was still powered, but now mortal. His android body was kidnapped by the villain Solomon Grundy, who wanted to transfer his mind into it. Before he could, however, John Smith and Solomon Grundy killed each other, though Zatanna was able to transfer Red Tornado's soul back into his android body just in time. This new android body, however, was infected with an amazovirus by the villain Professor Ivo, who had been working with Solomon Grundy. The body had to be destroyed, and the Red Tornado's consciousness had to be transferred to the Justice League supercomputer, during which time he finally proposed to Kathy Sutton, and she accepted. Red Tornado was rebuilt, again, this time in a self-repairing nanite body built by Cyborg, and he married Kathy. Red Tornado's family continued to grow afterward as he learned T.O. Morrow and Professor Ivo had created other androids possessing elemental powers, specifically the Red Torpedo with water powers, the Red Inferno with fire powers, and the Red Volcano with earth powers, the latter of whom was defeated by the others after he tried to destroy the planet. In post-Flashpoint continuity, Red Tornado seemingly lost his ties to the Tornado Champion, Planet Ran, and the JSA, and it was simply an android who went against his programming. Now powers-wise, Red Tornado has complete control over the wind and air, 
capable of creating gusts and vortices moving at hundreds of miles per hour, or generate winds just powerful enough to mimic telekinesis. He can manipulate the wind to levitate his android body, which itself is nigh indestructible, despite the number of times he's been destroyed in the comics. Mm -hmm. Though he's always been able to self-repair, thanks to his nanite body, any damage less than catastrophic can be rapidly repaired. He can lift 20 tons and has enhanced visual and auditory sensors, as well as a processing power far advanced than any supercomputer. He has a memory bank of hundreds of millions of terabytes and access to the Justice League servers. Outside his body, he's a violent sentient tornado that can possess other machines or people. And that's the red tornado. How does a sentient tornado possess people? Or machines, for that matter. He's air. He just goes inside them and like oh moves them around like a puppet. You know what's interesting is that there was a story where Sandman was also split into his good and evil personas and they fought. Was one of them like the sand tyrant and the other one the sand champion? No. Because <laughs> that would have been a total ripoff and I would totally would have called you out on it if it happened. Well, it didn't, but I thought that was an interesting coincidence. And now that we've got their histories and abilities out of the way, let's speculate on how one of the 1,000 simulated matches will go. The winner is determined by simulations, not this speculation, but it's fun to imagine how this fight could play out. And we don't set any rules for this match other than the characters don't know anything about each other going in, except that the other character is a threat that needs to be put down. And we say that they start off about 50 meters apart in an environment that has no bearing on the match itself because we don't take stats for the environment. Plus, certain characters have advantages in some environments over others, and we want these characters to win on their own merit. So let's get into it. Red Tornado and Sandman meet on the battlefield. Who goes first? I'm going to say that Sandman starts first because, you know, he's a little bit more brash. Red Tornado is a little bit more calculating given that he's a computer. So Sandman's going to start off by creating this like large boulder over his head, holding it. And he's just going to hurl it at Red Tornado and he's just going to land on him and crush him. I mean, Red Tornado, he's just going to like look at this thing like coming his way. And before it even gets close, he's just going to hold up his hand and create a, a force field of wind. So this is just going to stop that boulder halfway. And then he's going to generate a twisting vortex around him that just lifts him into the air. And he's going to like spiral like a howitzer missile just towards Sandman fists first, plowing into him and just scattering him everywhere. No, 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 no. Because Sandman's going to do his favorite trick in the book, which is when somebody punches him, he goes semi intangible and just lets the fists go through him. And then he solidifies rock hard, trapping his opponent's arms in his torso. So that's what he's going to do to Red Tornado. So Red Tornado is just like trapped in Sandman's body. And while he's stuck there, Sandman is going to create a giant hammer fist and a giant like spiked mace fist that just pummels the android and turns him into nuts and bolts. So like Red Tornado is like handcuffed and he's just getting beaten. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's a pretty good move. But I'm going to say even before Red Tornado can get like too badly damaged, he's going to generate this like tornado behind Sandman that's just going to suck him backward, like right into it. And then he's going to get scattered across the environment, which is going to give Red Tornado time to, you know, repair from the damage of being hit. OK, but as, as Sandman is, he's getting pulled back by this tornado. As he's getting sucked into it, he's going to turn rock hard. This sounds dirty. <laughs> but he's going to solidify into like stone and he's going to use the cyclone to slingshot himself back at Red Tornado as that guy's healing and just smash into him like a speeding bullet, slam him down and pin him to the ground. OK, I mean, Red Tornado, he's just going to explode from the ground like through Sandman in a spiral of this like violent wind, which he's going to like channel and direct back towards Sandman at full force, just launching him backward into the air, like way far. OK, but like Sandman can shapeshift so he can easily counter any gust of wind directed at him by transforming his body into like a, a smooth aerodynamic shape where the wind just passes over it. Well, like is, like is he smart enough to do that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I'm thinking like a long egg shape or something, something that would, you know, pass through a wind tunnel pretty easily. Uh -huh. So basically the wind is doing nothing. And in retaliation, Sandman is going to launch a volley of sand spikes that just cut through the wind force and impale Red Tornado right through his chest. Through his chest. Red Tornado, he's just going to look down and he's like, oh, did you think there were organs in this chest? 
he's just gonna look down and just crumble that spike like in his fist. And then he's just gonna like take to the air and just fly around Sandman at this really high velocity, generating a vacuum that's gonna pull Sandman's particles and his individual sand pieces apart like in every direction, just taking his body apart. You keep trying to do this, big whoop, you know? Okay, so <laughs> Sandman's body is spread across the battlefield. But with all Finally. the wind that Red Tornado has been generating this whole time, you know, it's kicked up a lot of dust and dirt and other stuff that Sandman can what? pull on. So he's going to draw in a lot of that material to reform his body away from Red Tornado's vacuum, and he's going to recreate himself in a giant-sized form, like six stories tall. And now that Sandman's, like, fucking huge with his increased mass, he's going to punch the ground and just slam into it repeatedly, breaking up the battlefield around them and creating even more sand and dirt to work with. Awesome. Yeah. So how big is he? You said six stories tall? Yeah. So six stories like a building. But you know what topples buildings? Fucking hurricanes. <laughs> Which is what Red Tornado makes, this hurricane force wind that knocks Sandman to the ground. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Okay, sure. Yeah, he falls to the ground and he like erupts into like this sand cloud. But that sand cloud is now just like covering everything. It's spread into the air. Every cubic inch of the surrounding area is now like a sandstorm. And there's so much sand in the air that Red Tornado, it's almost like he's swimming in it. You know, every gust that he tries to do to blow the sand away is displaced by more fucking sand. There's just so much sand and it completely covers and smothers Red Tornado, you know, getting in his ears and his mouth and in his butt crack, all up in his holes. What the fuck? And uh, the sand gets into his system and, and clogs his gears or whatever he has, nanites. The sand jams up the nanites. Oh, damn. Okay, so to get away from all of this sand, Red Tornado, he's going to like quickly generate a narrow wind funnel that lifts his like clogged body straight up into the air and it blows the sand like out of his inner working. So now he's like high above the battlefield away from all of the sand. Blows the sand out of his inner workings from where? From, from his nose? Of him. He's like air. He's like hollow. Okay. Well, before Red Tornado, you know, can get too far away, a giant fist of sand is just going to reach up from this pile of sand beneath him and just violently yank Red Tornado down to the ground, slamming him with 85 tons of force, and it's just going to break and crack open his android body like an egg. I was going to say, like, Red Tornado, he's pretty durable, but I actually do think that would break him. But you know what? doesn't fucking matter, because you've cracked him open, and now you've released the Tornado Champion. Just this massive tornado, like F5, F6 scale. Just this pure force of nature. You can't stop it or hurt it. Oh, you mean like how you can't stop or hurt Sandman? And in fact, Sandman, he's going to grow to the size of this tornado. What? And, and just punch it right in its tornado face, causing it to dissipate. Or I guess he'll just like, he'll clap his hands or something and just causes it to kind of, you know, fade away. Except the that end. like the tornado champion can possess other beings and objects. So before Sandman can do that, it's just going to take over Sandman and like absorb him into its being. And there's no way Sandman's like meager consciousness can overpower the air elemental. All right. So the tornado champion is now like the sandstorm champion and the winner of this match. But, okay, to even possess Sandman, the Tornado Champion would have to know which of the millions of grains of sand around the battlefield was the one grain of sand that houses Sandman's consciousness. Dude, there's no fucking way. He's a fucking huge tornado. I, I think he could, like, touch all of the grains of sand and figure it out. No, I call bullshit. Just because he touches all the grains of sand doesn't mean he's going to find the one that he needs to possess. It would take him forever. I say Sandman just causes the Tornado Champion to dissipate. And I think you're underestimating a fucking elemental being. It's like a god level. And I think you're underestimating just how much sand there is here. <laughs> but we'll go ahead and leave it there. Okay. So either Red Tornado just manages to find the single grain of sand that has Sandman's mind and then possess it, or he doesn't and Sandman dissipates the tornado. I think if Spider-Man can find that single grain of sand, Red Tornado can find it. Don't insult Spider-Man that way. Let's go ahead and input the stats on these characters, run the simulations, and find out who won. Let's do it. 
Elemental beings are always hard to speculate on because they can just do so much with the powers, and especially these two guys who are both essentially indestructible. Right. Like, how do you beat them? I mean, the Red Tornado has been beaten quite a few times, but it keeps coming back. Well, exactly, yeah. Same thing with Sandman. You can't really beat them. They're Immortal. everlasting. Yeah. But I bet you that when we were putting in the stats, you got pretty scared at just how statistically awesome Sandman is. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. He hits like the highest level we have on a number of categories. Uh, we said Sandman was maxed out when it came to evasiveness and durability. Yeah, and he's really high up there on strength as well. Although he came in just shy of Red Tornado's damage potential because Red Tornado can literally destroy a city on a whim. Red Tornado also came out ahead in terms of intellect and perception because he does have a computer mind that has infinite recall and enhanced auditory and visual sensors. And he's also faster than Sandman. Right, right, because he could generate really fast winds to fly. But Sandman is a better fighter. Right. Sandman has been trained by Captain America as a member of the Avengers, and he's been a brawler his whole life, pretty much. Now, with all this in consideration, who's winning this one? Who's your money on? You know, I'm going to give it to Red Tornado just because I keep going to the fact that like what erodes the earth wind. You know, it's like there's nothing really that the earth can do to the wind to like destroy it. It is indestructible. It can divert the wind. That's fair. But like is diverting beating. I'm going to say yes. Diverting is winning. I don't know why, <laughs> but it is. Well, I don't know why then. I just want Red Tornado <laughs> to win because it's DC. Okay. Our Instagram followers voted for Red Tornado to win 64% over 36. And I feel like theoretically that makes sense because I think at first glance people will just like look at the match and be like, but wind can just blow away sand. So, you know. Right. But what they probably forgot to consider is Sandman's versatility. You know, he can become rock hard, which still sounds weird to say. (laughs) He can become, you know, intangible. He has a lot going for him. So let me go ahead and tell you who the winner is. The winner between Red Tornado and Sandman is Red Tornado. Yes! Red Tornado won 562 matches out of the 1,000 simulations, whereas Sandman only won 438. So it was 56.2% to 43.8. That's pretty close. I actually thought there was going to be a a wider gap there. Yeah, in the end, even though Sandman had evasiveness and durability and strength on his side, Red Tornado was just too powerful, too fast, and too smart. Yeah, his computer mind and and sensors feel like really gave him a leg up this match. I guess it's a case of mind over matter, you know, brain over brawn, good over evil. Well, I mean, Sandman's not entirely evil. You know, he's kind of a conflicted villain traditionally. Well, yeah, it was kind of the same way with Red Tornado, too, right? He's a good guy, but for some reason, he's always turning against the Justice League and trying to fight them. And and actually, these guys had a lot more in common than I initially thought. Like, they're both not entirely human. Right. It's interesting. I think it was a pretty good matchup. And even though Red Tornado won, you know what? He's going to be fighting sand in weird places for, you know, a long time. And in the end, you know, being annoying to DC heroes is just as good as beating them. Is it really that annoying? All you need is canned air. Just put a straw in there. Psst, there you go. He basically is canned air. <laughs> That's true. So now we know who would win in a fight between canned air and a sandbag. There you go. These results solved a lot of questions. Never had my deaths. Well, that does it for this duel. Uh, let us know what you thought about the results by writing to us at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com or by visiting us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can find links to all of our accounts by checking out our show notes or visiting our website, dynamicduel.com. And on our site, you can also find a link to our Patreon page where we offer bonus content, including bonus episodes and bloopers, monthly live movie watch-alongs, collectible pin sets, and access to our Discord server. Check it out right after this episode. Our lowest tier is only two bucks a month. In our next episode, we will be reviewing the new DC animated film, Catwoman Hunted. Uh, It looks pretty interesting. It's very, very anime in style. Yeah, the movie actually comes out today, the day this episode airs. So be sure to check it out if you want to follow along with our review, as it will be a spoiler review. But that does it for this episode. We want to give a big thanks to our executive producers, John Spees, Ken Johnson, Jace Crump, John Starosky, Zachary Hepburn, Mitchell Phipps, Dustin Belcom, Salvador Hernandez Contreras Jr., and Levi Yeaton for helping make this podcast possible. We'll talk to you guys next week. Up, up, and away. True believers.